I bet they're stumped by the case as well. Uh, Gallagher... Gallagher... Uh, where could he be? <sighs> Apologies. The Bloodhound family is running an investigation up ahead. No unauthorized personnel allowed. Hold on a minute... I think I've seen you before. The, the gray-haired one. How much trouble have you stirred up exactly on Penacony? Not possible. It was you the last time yelling about some clockwork friendship while beating me up with that silver-haired girl. Uh, uh. Uh. I'm not letting you get by this time. Please leave, or I'll have to get on my knees and beg you. Huh? What kind of heinous crime have you committed now? Hold on, sir. We have documents authorized by the family that would aid your investigation. If it wouldn't trouble you, could we see this Mr. Gallagher? Who exactly is this Gallagher you keep talking about? There have been a few people mentioning this name. Even the one with the gray hair. Uh, he didn't send you all here? It was the security officer who dispatched us. That's all I can divulge. Uh, he'll do! He's the one we've been looking for! <sighs> Sorry, no can do. The boss said that since it's a matter of the family's reputation, no one's allowed through. Everyone, please leave. There's really no need for us to make things difficult for each other, right? We're really sorry for troubling you. <sighs> Let's think of another way. Another way? Uh, that's it! Didn't they say something about that... Oh, uh, what was it? Clockwork? That got this guy to change his mind? Can you perform it again? That... Uh, clocky magic! Please? <sighs> Sorry. No can do. The boss said that since it's a matter of the family's reputation... Everyone, please... Time it is now. Whoa! It's this time already! Time to clock out! And no one's gonna stop me. Uh, what? Huh? <laughs> uh, this clockwork trick of yours, it's kinda dangerous. At least he won't be getting in our way again. Let's go find that Gallagher, and ask him the intricacies of the case. I was wondering what all the commotion was. Huh. Oh, it's you guys. Welcome. Since you made it here, what can I do for you? Hello, Mr. Gallagher, sir. Judging from your tone, it sounds like you were expecting us. <laughs> Miss Himako, you're too polite. There's no need to call me sir. Mr. Gallagher, you even know my name. Of course I do. You folks are from the legendary Astral Express and honorable guests of the Watchmaker. I had an encounter with this lady in the Golden Hour. I remember that little silver-haired girl was there too. I'm sorry for what happened to that kid. This is also the reason why we've come to visit you, Mr. Gallagher. The Express can't just overlook the death of that child. So we've decided to help the family get to the bottom of it, in the hopes of getting justice for her. The Nameless involved with the family. What an unpredictable twist of fate. Why? 
What's wrong with the family? Uh, it's nothing. On Penicone, everyone loves the family. No matter how much one resists the beautiful dream, when the time comes, they too will find it hard to let go. Who wants to leave a warm nest? Just idiots, little kids, and inebriated fools. Mr. Gallagher seems to be getting at something. You got it wrong. I'm not. You want to discuss the case? Sure. Come with me. This is not a good place to talk. Let's go elsewhere. Even after that chilling tragedy, this dream is still running effortlessly. Other than the family of the Harmony, it's hard to imagine any other power in the universe that could sustain a building of such magnitude. The family itself is a huge, perfect building. Like a living idol. Each member of the family sees themselves as a piece of the divine puzzle revolving around a singular core and a shared ideal. Under their command, they loyally fulfill their roles, offering themselves while also receiving sustenance in return. Interesting analogy. Perhaps that's why Penacone's beautiful dream has persisted for so long. But the human body has its limits, and so does the Divine's. That doesn't sound like the kind of comment a Galaxy Ranger would make. Just pointing out the facts. Mr. Yang will definitely have a better sense of what's going on than I do. Why do you say that, Miss Acheron? The beautiful dream is crumbling. But not because of a particular eon, a particular faction, or a particular visitor. Its collapse stems from a certain inevitability of human nature. The family refuses to acknowledge this, and it has ultimately backfired and become a catalyst. As people immerse their souls in the dreamscape, where consequences and pain cease to exist, and only ease and pleasure prevail, they draw closer and closer to necrosis. Regardless of the perceived bliss, death looms as the inevitable conclusion. Also, this necrosis will diffuse and spread, one piece of the puzzle's mutation will eventually cause the entire building to shake, break, and crumble. In the end, the dreams that people built in the name of freedom became the cage that imprisoned them. I'm sure you've gained a lot from this trip, Miss Acheron. Are you willing to share your findings with me? Of course. That's if I remember. It's just a habit. Owing to events in the past, I've become easily... forgetful. It's only when this sword is unsheathed that those hazy memories start to become clearer. Take your time. That should do it. I vividly remember everything that occurred on Penacone. Ask away. The moment of daybreak. I've heard that's where the Dawn Factory, which processes the foundation of the dreamscape, is located. Behind the dreamscape's song and dance stand many imagination factories. Workers create all kinds of whimsical works day in and day out in their dreams, and they return to reality and sleep on a narrow bed in a room. A far cry from luxury. They say it will suffice. Experiencing the bizarre and motley dreamscape is the best reward. There I encountered a young woman who had just come of age, 
the perfect time to indulge in beautiful dreams. Her greatest wish was to one day move to the golden hour and see the magnificent garments she had woven with her own hands. For certain reasons, her wish was difficult to fulfill. But I managed to bring her a garment. Gilded Hour. It's said to be Penacone's currency center. Yes. It is a fortress-like financial city, the economic heart of the dreamscape. The Papeshi people of the Alfalfa family are there to keep it running, sending blood that is made from money everywhere on Penacone. Everyone there is exquisitely dressed and always in a hurry. The greatest wish of the local Papeshi people is for their future generations to work in the Gilded Hour. I've never met anyone who is willing to talk. I could only stand at the crossroads, watching crowds of people hurrying like the wind through the jungle of steel, only to deposit the alfalfa credits that they'd earned into the bank's vault. I don't know if they would open the vault door, but before I left, I witnessed a well-dressed Papeshi person plummet from the sky. All those around him continued on their way, unfazed. I hear the Blue Hour is very romantic. Do you have any tales to share? Perhaps Mr. Yang has heard. There is a large boat called the Aventide anchored along the Sea of Dreams, where soft music and dancing persist endlessly every night. I ran into a wizened lady there. She was at the dock, waiting for her long-departed lover to return, waiting for countless hours within time that stood still. In the humid sea breeze, she spoke of her own youth. Like many who desired wealth and love, they came to Panacone to pursue their dreams. Alas, her lover's consciousness was lost in the dark depths of the Sea of Dreams. Finally, she suggested we continue our conversation on a boat in the shallows. I agreed and boarded the boat with her. But she never said anything. Her eyes absent-mindedly gazing at the horizon for what seemed like forever. Finally, we retreated to the beach. The dreamscape of chic luxury and consumerism, the moment of dusk. My companions have been there too. Then you all must have seen those who are attempting to realize their dreams. Or have realized them. Scattering money as if it were dust and betting it on all or nothing. Everything has a price. And everything can be bought or sold. Even dreams themselves. I saw an Intellitron there, who was preparing to auction himself. When someone wins a bid, under stipulated periods and rules, he would do the buyer's every bidding, becoming that person's very possession. That Intellitron had been auctioned off a dozen times, and I participated in his thirteenth. That was the grandest banquet I had ever attended. But never again did anyone cast another glance at him. This time around, there were no successful bids for him. This is what I've seen and heard along the way. Someone once said to me, Panacone wasn't like this a long time ago, nor should it be. I've traveled through the reality and dreamscape of the planet of festivities. Watch the tides of night rise and fall when time stopped for people. Where the spirits of the rich and impoverished remain forever fixed on their own scales. This is why I think the collapse of the beautiful dream is inevitable. There might be a way to change everything. Perhaps. But if this is indeed the world that people desire, if this is precisely why life chooses to slumber, should we still seek to change it? Uh, 
Miss Acheron, now it's my turn to share a story with you. There was a man from my homeland who, at a time when the world was grappling with deep, unhealable pain, made a choice. He wove together the dreams of everyone in the world, linking people's dreamscapes, and shouldered this burden himself. From this, he created a giant, a spiritual Adam. And since that moment, the giant stood between heaven and earth, becoming the pillar of the world's existence. As a price, those who found it hard to move forward, who could not advance, forever lost their future. They slumbered in a dream, devoid of disaster and pain, living out their days peacefully in the man's created utopia. And it is because of the wishes of those people who wished not to awaken that this spiritual Adam became unbreakable. And yet, you stand here right now which also means that man failed. Because people must always move towards the future. Even if human weaknesses make them pause when they truly cannot move forward, humanity will eventually seek a way to save itself. And that man, he was never a failure. Like everyone in that world, he etched the possibilities of human nature into his heart. He was the sun chaser of legend, soaring towards the sky and embracing his final victory with his fall. He ascended to heights uncharted, only to come face to face with the sun, a place not visited by anyone before. His wings would melt because of it, only for him to fall into the sea, and after that, countless others would surpass him, soaring to even greater heights. A fitting metaphor for the Nameless's trailblazing spirit. Thank you, Mr. Yang. I know what you wish to confirm. The universe has innumerable similar, yet different, worlds. In these worlds, there are innumerable people who look alike, yet don't. I too have embarked on journeys, encountering old friends with familiar faces on different worlds, witnessing their destinies follow paths similar to mine. So I will tell you, even if not completely similar, the story you just told it overlaps with my past, and within that abyssal dream. I ended that man's life, alone. <sighs> I am not who you think I am, nor will my home be as fortunate as your world. I am sorry. It's fine. I don't mind so long as I can alleviate your suspicions. There's something I still wish to know, Miss Acheron. Under that representation of the hunt, exactly what sort of power is it that has motivated your solitary journey thus far? Mr. Yang, before answering that question, I wish to continue the previous topic. I like your analogy very much. Indeed, birds are born to fly. But in a distant past, their ancestors could only gaze at the sky in envy. They saw that faraway ray of light from above the heavens, piercing through the clouds and blanketing the earth. And so, time and time again, generation after generation, the birds spread their wings and took to the sky, attempting to touch its ceiling all because the sun was there. Then, what if the last bird finally soars into the sky, only to realize that the end of the light is not the sun, but darkness? 
Then why, exactly, do we even walk towards the light? Time no see. Having fun on Pentacony? Acheron. <laughs> <laughs> 